On today's show, we're going to be talking about how to do a multi-camera shoot for a live event. We're going to go through a checklist of pre-production, packing lists, things you do on set, and do everything we can to make sure that you're ready for your next big shoot. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show here at youtube.com slash photojoseph every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific, talking about all things photography, video, live streaming, and today we're talking video shooting specifically, oh, I just lost my ears, specifically video shooting for a three-camera, multi-camera, any number of camera, shoot for a live production. So my ears just popped out and then it's like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't operate properly when my ears are, okay, we're just going to have to put that on hold for a second here while I pop that back in. Very odd when that happens because suddenly things go silent and you hear things you're not supposed to. Ha, huh, all better. So this all came together because I did a three camera shoot last uh, week. Yeah, well, last week when I was down in LA for Panasonic, it was for an event at Cinegear Expo. There was a live presentation, a live uh, audience, uh, not audience, uh, um, a Q&A with a couple of filmmakers. And so there are five people up on stage, a host and two filmmakers and their uh, production or DPs and, and so on that was with them. And uh, Panasonic asked me since I was going to be there to go ahead and shoot this event and edit it together and, you know, get it up on YouTube. So I did all that. And um, I've, I learned a few things that I actually, I made, I, I made, I made a pretty bad mistake. I um, was able to cover for it and we'll get into that. But um, I, as a result of all that, I thought, you know, I learned a couple things here that if you've never done this before would definitely be useful to know. If you've done these shoots before, then you probably just stop watching now. You're not, probably not gonna learn anything new. But if you've never done a multi-camera shoot before, especially the kind of thing where you're gonna pack up all your gear and take it somewhere, then um, this, could be, this could be useful and interesting. So let's, uh, let's just get right into my checklist, and I will include this checklist down below as well, so you can copy and paste this if you find it useful. And obviously, if you're watching this uh, live or later, and you have any additions to this checklist, then uh, stick them in the notes, stick them in the comments, and I will update the list as we go, because I, I think this could be useful. It'll make it kind of a crowdsourced type of a thing. So let's uh, let's start off with, oh, I guess that switch didn't work out so well. Let's start off with this, my pre-production checklist. So first things first. What's your camera layout? What are you shooting? If you're doing a three camera shoot, what are you planning on doing? A wide, medium, and tight shot? That's pretty standard, and that's what I did here. We had one really good wide shot to get the, kind of the whole house, get the stage, get the audience, obviously get the people on the stage, the screen or part of the screen behind them. I want to have that good, wide, establishing shot. And then a medium shot, which in my case was a, a shot that covered all five people on stage, and that was basically it, fill the camera with them. And then I had a tight shot, one that was a much longer lens. I ended up using the 200 millimeter f 2.8 that we've been talking about here on the show. And I used that so that I could get in, I could get two to three people in the shot at once and frame at once, which worked out really well. And that camera, I was manually operating. So that was part of the decision. Are you going to be manually operating one of the cameras? Is there more than one of you? Can you have multiples of you operating multiple cameras? Or is this a one-man operation like it was for me, in which case I had two locked shots and then one that I was manually operating. But, you know, these are decisions you have to make. So you make those decisions. Um, what is the delivery requirement? Are you delivering in 4K, and then obviously shooting in 4K, or are you delivering 1080p, in which case can you shoot 4K, and then have the ability to punch into a shot to reframe it to get an extra camera angle? And that's what I did. I delivered in, in 1080p, shot in 4K, and this ended up being useful for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them was my widest shot. I decided it's just a little bit too wide. I went ahead and cropped in just a little bit, like 10% or so, and that just made that shot a little bit better. So cool. So I had that capability to do because I had shot 4K. The medium shot I left alone, the close-up shot was, I don't think I ever punched in on that. But then when we got into where I had a problem, and again, we'll, we'll cover that later, um, uh, having that ability to reframe made it look like I had more cameras than I did. A little tip to the hat of what's happening there. So, uh, but think, plan that. Plan that in advance. If you're going to deliver 1080p, maybe it means maybe you don't necessarily shoot 1080p. Maybe you go ahead and shoot 4K anyway, just so you have that flexibility. Um, get a layout of the house if you can. If you know where you're going to be shooting, well, presumably you know where you're going to be shooting, if you can get a layout of the area, if you haven't ever seen it before, I mean, if you can scout the location, all the better, right? But we were shooting on the Paramount back lot in the Paramount Theater at, um, at, at in Hollywood, at Paramount Studios. And I'd never been in there before. And so I was able to have them send me a schematic of it so I could see what the layout was. And I realized, you know, where the stage was, where I could potentially be, and so on. And to be honest, it didn't help as much as I would have liked it. Once I got there, um, it was like, oh, okay, now I kind of get it. But uh, still, I think it's better than nothing. So if you can get that, you know, it's, it's worth asking for. 
ensure you know the audio configuration. So the, the audio recording, when it comes to a video production like this, audio is arguably more important than video. Or you got a bunch of talking heads on stage. If we don't see them the whole time, it's not the end of the world. But if you can't hear them the whole time, you got the problem, right? So you got to have good audio. And good audio means not just recording with a couple of microphones on camera. You need to tap into the house audio. You need to get that feed so that you have the same quality audio that the audience is hearing. That means that there's a sound. If there's a place like this, there's going to be a sound guy, right? They are mixing the levels, adjusting the levels of every person on stage to ensure that they are consistent, they're not peaking, and so on. You want to tap into that feed. So how are you going to do that? Well, obviously, this means planning ahead of time with the uh, production designer or the sound guy or whoever is your contact there, but planning that ahead. And that means knowing where you're going to be able to tap into the audio, what cables you might need, if you're going to need a, um, a manual, uh, a mail to mail XLR tap, right? So this is one of the things that I found. They told me that I was going to need a mail mail adapter. And I didn't, I wouldn't have brought that if they hadn't told me because it's not something I've ever had before. I had to buy these. So little mail mail taps. Um, I guess we can't really, uh, my close-ups aren't set up. Anyway, it's just a little male-male XLR adapter because typically your XLR cables are female on one end, male on the other. It's basically an extension cord. Um, this reverses one of them, uh, one end of that, so that you have male to male. For whatever reason, the way their audio rig was set up, that's what uh, that's what I needed to have. So, you know, important to, to know what you need in advance. You don't want to get there and find out, oops, you don't have the right cable. So, um, and then also... What I wasn't able to do here, but I was hoping I was going to be able to do, was to get an audio recording from the house. So some soundboards, like the one that I use here even, I can record my audio separately, right? And I do that. I, th this show that you're watching right now, the, the audio is being recorded along with the video, but I also record the audio separately. Some soundboards allow you to do that, some don't. So if the production house has a soundboard that is modern enough where you can do that, ask if you can get that file. Because then, even if you're still recording the audio, and you should be, you know, you, you want redundancy in this case, always. It's live production, there's no going back, have redundancy. I mean, if you can get a file from the house, then that's awesome, right? Because you've got their mix nice and clean, they're going to hand that file over to you, you know it's good to go. And further, depending on the, the level of their board, you might even be able to get isolated recordings off of each mic. Now, how great would that be? Right, you get your mix of the whole thing, but then you also get ISOs. So if you have five people on camera, five different mics, if you get an individual track off of each of them, if one of them coughs at some point, if one of their phone rings, as happened on ours, um, you can turn their mic at least down or off for that portion of the show and maybe not completely eliminate it because that cough or sound will get picked up on other mics, but it won't be right into the microphone. Now, there were a couple times on this, and, and I didn't get an ISO recording. That wasn't an option. There were a couple instances on here where somebody wearing a mic did something else. They, um, you know, bumped themselves or bent down and did something and made some, some other noise on the microphone. There was absolutely nothing that I could do that, about that because I didn't have isolated recordings. It was right over somebody else's dialogue, so I couldn't cut it out. But if you can get those isolated recordings, then that'll allow you to do an even better production, a better sound mix later. So different options to think about, um, but if you, whatever you're doing, make sure you know what you're doing in advance. That's the main thing there. Um, and then renting gear. Right. If you don't have to, well, first of all, you may not have enough cameras, so you may have to be renting gear for this. But especially if you're traveling, consider renting gear that you either don't want to carry because it's too valuable or too heavy or too cumbersome or inconvenient or just cheaper to rent than it is to carry, whatever it might be. In my case, I rented three big video tripods. Number one, I don't own three big video tripods. But number two, even if I did, I really want to carry them because it's a big, heavy, honking things. I'd have to pay all this excess baggage. It was easier to just rent them. Now, I was in LA, so I could rent from Sammy's camera. Really good, super easy local. Passed Sammy's on, uh, from the airport to Paramount. Picked them up along the way. That was awesome. Um, but, <laughs> huh, thank God for American Express, I didn't realize until I picked up from Sammy's that I had to put down a deposit for the full value. $2,500 deposit on my credit card. Well, fortunately, it was on the Amex, so it's not. You know, if you don't have $2,500 available credit on your credit card, or you don't use credit cards, you're going to have a problem, right? So fortunately, uh, Amex, yay, put that on the charge card, taken off when you pick it up. But that is something you have to remember. If you're renting from a local house, they may be doing that. If you can rent from a place like Borrow, or if you don't have a local house and you want to rent online, borrowlenses.com and lensrentals.com are two that I really, really love. Um, borrow Lenses specifically, I think Lens Rentals might do this, I'm not sure, but I know Borrow Lenses does. They will actually ship to a UPS store. 
right? So if you're you're staying in a hotel or like I was at an Airbnb and it's getting your stuff shipped to that address might be a bit challenging. You know, you don't know if somebody's gonna be there to receive it. I've had stuff shipped to the hotels before and then it's kind of lost in the system for hours while well, I don't know what happened to it. If you can avoid that and pick it up yourself, that's great. And a great way to do that with borrowed lenses is to have it shipped to a UPS store. Like in LA, there's dozens of them. I think there's, I think that on the website it says there's over 4,000 UPS stores around the country, um, or around the world perhaps, I'm actually not sure. But anyway, you can have it shipped to that. So you can just drive to the nearest location there. You look it up on your map, right? Here's my hotel, here's my venue. Oh look, here's a UPS store right between them. Boom, stop there to pick it up in advance. And that's choice. So definitely, definitely consider doing that. Um, so I rented the tripods and I ended up renting an XLR cable because cables are big and long and, you know, I was trying to pack as small as I could. I actually managed to, if you believe it or not, pack everything I needed into this case. And um, and I realized as I was packing, like, the XLR cable is just this massive thing in here. This is silly. Called up Sammy's. Yep, add that to the order. A few extra bucks for the cable and we're good to go. So so that's something to consider. Um, okay. Oop, that's the moment. There we go. So that's the main pre-production stuff. Those are the main tips that I wanted. I'm sure you have more. Please put them into the comments, put them into the chat. I will uh, I will add them to the list later on. All right now we get into the actual packing list. What are you gonna bring? Well, obviously it's gonna depend on your shoot, but here's a list of things that you're probably going to want for this. Some obvious, some not so obvious. Obvious one, as many bodies as you're gonna need and a backup if you can. So I shot three cameras, I brought three cameras. Um, I didn't bring another backup, probably should have, but I didn't. But anyway, I, I had three cameras in here, that's what I was shooting, so great. Um, a variety of lenses, right? You may think, okay, I need a wide, medium, and tight shot, so I'll bring a wide, medium, and tight lens, but you may find that where you're positioning your camera is you might need a longer lens than you thought for a particular scene or a wider lens than you thought for a particular setup. So bring a variety of lenses. I put a lot, well, we're gonna take a look in here in a moment, but I put a lot of gear into this. Um, I did bring a lot of lenses, I brought seven, six, seven lenses, I think. Obviously, only needed three. And, uh, and of course, then set up, you know, what, what fit for there. So I decided where to put a camera once I was there and use, like, my widest shot, for example, the one that had the whole stage, was shot with the 35 to 100 mil lens. So that's a 200 mil equivalent and from the very, very back of the house. And so that ended up being the widest shot, but using the medium-ist lens that I had in the bag. So, so there's that to consider. So just bring a lot of lenses. Bring choice. Bring options. Uh, bring more camera batteries than you need because you never know. Bring more than you need. Kind of obvious advice, but bring more than you need. Um, bring at least one battery charger per camera. And the reason I say this is if you are the night before, maybe you've got two days of production, you've got to charge everything again the night before, or you get there and you went, huh, got here without charged batteries, or uh, or maybe you have it's such a long production that you have to swap out batteries and recharge during the shoot. If you have a charger per camera minimum, then you know that when you pull out a battery, you can immediately put it on a charger. It can hopefully be at a, on a charger that's by the camera. Um, you will be able to charge up batteries for each camera at once. It's just, just don't go into somewhere with 10 batteries and one charger. Not a good idea. Uh, backup AA batteries, if you're using something that takes AA batteries, like the audio recorder, we'll talk about this too. But uh, bring, if you use rechargeables, awesome. I love rechargeables, I use them all the time. But bring standard, what alkaline stuff they're called, bring standard batteries as well as backup because you just never know. Sometimes rechargeables don't last as long as you thought they would. Or just, just have them. It's like a cheap insurance policy. Just have regular batteries with you as well. Can't hurt. Uh, AC adapters. If you know you'll have access to power, right, if you're going to be setting your camera somewhere where you can tap into the wall, then great. Go with that option. Then you don't have to worry about the batteries. One less thing to worry about, especially for really long production. Uh, but of course, it does mean extra stuff. You've got the charger. You're going to have to have extension cords and, and uh, surge strips and all that good stuff. So plan for it. But if you can use AC power, that might be to your advantage. Again, it's going to depend on the production, but it's one of those things to consider. So extension cords and power strips, if you are using AC, you're going to need that. Um, next up, memory cards. Obviously, you're going to need your memory cards. Uh, tripods, don't forget your tripods or rent them if that's the if that works out better for you. Audio cables and accessories. Make sure, again, going back to knowing your audio, make sure you know what you've got. Make sure you know what you need. Do you need um, XLR cables? Do you need more than one? Do you need those male to male adapters? Do you need short cables, long cables, whatever it might be? Make sure you've got it all packed or rented in advance. Microphones for each camera. Very, very important. And here's why. So, I've got this, and I've got a couple other mics like this. I put uh, I put this on one of my cameras. I had the XLR adapter on another one, pulling off the house sound. And then the third camera, I just left the. I didn't put a mic on. I just used the you know the in camera mic. 
turns out that that camera was so far away that it barely picked up anything, and it actually had a hard, uh, Final Cut Pro had a hard time syncing it because it just just was not enough audio in there. So have one, even if you're not going to use it for anything other than syncing, have an on-camera mic. You'll get better audio, and better for syncing. And if you do have a decent mic on there, the sound that that camera does pick up will be the house sound, the audience, the applause, the laughter, whatever house sound there is. You might want that. You might want to mix that in. Because we've all heard before where you're listening to a production and there's someone on stage and they're either holding a mic or they're wearing a mic or whatever. And there's uproarious laughter or applause in the audience. And what you hear is, and then the, in the background, because you're hearing the person on stage clapping, you're hearing there, and you don't hear everybody else's because the sound, the house wasn't mic'd up for that or the, the mix didn't have that in there. Have on-camera audio so that you can mix that in later and it'll make the production sound so much better. When that applause comes, you can bring that up and then pull it back out again um, as, as, uh, as the laughter applause stops. So do, do, don't do forget that. That's an important one. That's a really important one. Um, XLR camera input, if you are gonna take in house sound, how are you recording that? In my case, I was shooting on GH5s, so I took the XLR1, put that on the camera, took the XLR audio from the soundboard, popped it straight into the camera, awesome. So if that's how you're doing it, don't forget that in your packing list. Audio recorder, this saved my bacon. And this is a really critical part to have. Have a separate dedicated audio recorder. Don't rely on the audio being recorded in camera, even if you are pulling XLR audio from the board into the camera directly. And the reason for that is, if that camera has to shut down for any reason, you have to stop recording because the show went long and you ran out of space on the card, uh, the battery is going to die and you have to swap it out. Whatever, you have now stopped that recording, you no longer have that clean audio all the way through. So have a separate audio recording. Be able to record the entire show in a recorder that you don't have to stop. You know, an auto recorder can record for like freaking days and days and not have to worry about it. Make sure that you have that so you have that backup. It's, it's going to be a really important part of it. And again, in my situation, totally saved my butt. Um, wired headphones for audio monitoring. I actually forgot this. I brought wireless headphones. Kind of when I was doing my final pack, I went, you know, I'm just going to take my wired headphones. I don't need them. I can edit with the wireless ones. It's not as good, but I can edit. That's fine. Um, forgot about the fact that when I was on set, I was going to need to have headphones to monitor the audio on each camera to make sure that the audio was good, especially the one that was coming in from the XLRs. Fortunately, the sound guy had an extra pair, so I was able to grab his, but don't forget wired headphones. Very important. The last one on here is a headlamp or a mouth gripping flashlight, you know, a little flashlight you can hold in your mouth, because chances are you're going to be in the dark. And if you're in the dark and you need to make an adjustment to your camera, tripod, whatever, you might need to be able to see. And you go, well, that's fine. I've got, you know, got a light on my camera, I can, on my phone. I can do that. But then you only have one hand. Have a light you can put on your head or hold, flashlight you can hold in your mouth that'll allow you to use both hands and get what you... It's very frustrating. I found it very frustrating because the lights went down and I'm trying to adjust something and I'm trying to hold this and like... And just get a, a light for that. I think it'd be a good idea. Um, I'm sure this kind of thing you pick up in. Kmart for a couple of bucks. Did I just say Kmart? They even still around. Pick up at the store for a couple of bucks. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, let's take a look. Before we do that, let's take a look in the box here. Let's see what I did pack in here. So let me make some space and argh, open this guy up. Let's go for the overhead view. That's a little bit wide. So three batteries. Boom, boom, boom. Three batteries. Three cameras. GH5, two GH5s and a GH5S. Uh, this was the, a short XLR cable that I used for the audio recorder. So that was, there's my old Tascam. I don't use this very often anymore, but this is what I use to capture the audio. Then I did bring the, uh, the BG one, the battery grip. I ended up not needing it, but, um, but I had that in there. And then of course there is the XLR one, which you needed for the XLR audio tap. So I have that. Uh, lens, everything else in here is pretty much lenses. So I brought a variety, but let's see what I used. 8 to 18, I didn't expect to use that for the show, but I brought it anyway, so I had that, didn't use it. Uh, 12 to 35, did use that one for sure. 12 to 60, again, honestly, the only reason I put that in there was because I had extra space, probably didn't need it, but I brought it. My 50, or, my, or rather my 25, 0.95, just in case it was way darker than I expected, I needed a shallow depth of field shot, whatever, I, I brought this, didn't use it, but I brought it. Uh, same thing for the 1517 in case I needed that really wide. I didn't expect to, but it's tiny, so I brought that. 35 to 100, that is the one that I used as the widest shot. This camera was at the back of house. And, and then that's the camera, that, the lens that I used for the close-up shot. So that is the, um, the 200 millimeter f2.8, use that for the close-ups. 
And then what else is in here? Oh, battery pack for charging phones and whatever else you might need. So that's in there with some USB cables. And then everything else is just cables, lights, little battery chargers, that kind of stuff. It's boring. You don't need to see all that. But that was that basic. And it all fit in this nice little case that I was able to carry on. I didn't want to have to check my bag for obvious reasons. Um, this is great because it's carry-on size. I always forget the model number of this Pelican case. We'll list it down in the show notes. I always forget what this is. People always ask. We'll list it down below. It is the largest... Oh, here. It says it right here. Um, 1510. Pelican 1510. It's the largest carry-on legal size. And for small planes, like I fly out of my airport, you do have to gate check it, but at least you can watch it get onto the plane and watch it come off the plane and take it right away. So, excellent. All right. Um, night before the shoot. That's where we are now. Let's go into here. There we go. The night before the shoot. Um... What are you going to do? Make sure your batteries are charged. You know your batteries are charged before you left? Check again. Make sure your batteries are all charged up. Make sure your cards are formatted. Make sure they're ready to go. You don't want to be there on the day of going, oh, wait, I got six cards to reform. Just get them all set the night before. Ensure your cameras have the same settings. And if you're using the Lumix cameras or a camera that does, that consider saving your settings to a memory card and copying them to all your cameras to make sure they're consistent all the way across. Um, I didn't do that because I have kind of some custom things in each camera. I don't want them all the same. But what I did was I laid all three cameras down went through the critical menu settings, like the recording setting, you know, 4K, 30P, the ISO, the white balance, all that sort of thing, and made sure they were all the same. And just went through them one by one, bringing all the menus up at the same time, making sure that all three cameras were exactly the same. Super important to do and make sure that your settings are consistent all the way through. So do that. Um, if using rental gear, <laughs> check it all completely the night before. Um, for example, just, you know, totally off the top of my head, make sure the camera heads are tight. So here's what I ran into. Um, and this is, again, this is one of my mistakes, small mistake, but it, annoyance, really annoying. So you know how your tripod and then your tripod head attaches to it. So I've got my long shot, or the tight shot rather, my uh, the one that I'm actually manually operating. And I'm, you know, panning side. It's a nice fluid head, side to side zooming, you know, whatever, you know, moving the camera around. And then suddenly the head comes loose from the legs and now it's spinning freely. So I no longer have a smooth pan. Are you kidding me? I didn't think to check this. Why, why would this even be loose? And there was nothing I could do about it. I could not tighten it. So I really had, I kept kind of, like, I you know, locked down the tripod, crank it as hard as I could, loosen up, and it just kept coming undone. And when I brought the tripods back to Sammy's and I told the guy about it, he's like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. The guys upstairs should have checked that. But what happens is people get these things for rentals. They want to use a different head. They take the heads off and then they put them back on, but they don't bother tightening them. And then if they don't get checked, the next customer ends up with that problem. So. Point being, super check your rental equipment. Make sure you not only know exactly how it works, you know where all the levers and dials are, but that everything is operating the way you would expect it to. Everything is tight the way you'd expect it to. So learn from my mistake there. Um, yeah, you know, you may be in the dark trying to make adjustments to gear you're unfamiliar with. So just do what you can to make sure that you are totally ready for it. All right. Um, and then be packed and ready to run. Right. So the night before, you may be leaving it five, six, seven, eight o'clock the next morning, don't plan on packing anything. I'm just like, you're tired, like, okay, just, I'll, I'll put that stuff in the back. No, just have everything packed, locked, ready to go. I'm gonna run out the door, everything is set and, and good. So um, in, in the case of if you're charging batteries overnight, then make sure that is the last thing you have to pack. So just, it's a simple thing. Just make sure you are totally packed and ready to go. Okay, so that's that. Um, we're gonna go on to the next one, but before we do that, I do wanna bring up another slide here. I want to remind you guys of my value for value proposition that we have here on this show. Essentially, if you feel like you have taken value, gained value from this show, then please consider putting value back. Head over to photojoseph.com support, and there are so many ways you can contribute to the show. You can become a regular Patreon com uh, contributor. You can do one-off donations, contributions through PayPal. You can shop in my uh, in my online store. It's, uh, there's a kit.com link. It's actually kit.com slash photojoseph but it's also linked from here. All the toys that you might need are, are in there. And if, of course, if you're buying through there, then that really, that helps out. Those little uh, percentages do add up. If you are looking for more education, I'm an author on lynda.com. So you can sign up for lynda.com using my link there. And then, of course, any of my shows that you watch will help keep me afloat. And finally, you do have the ability to hire me directly. I am available for all kinds of fun stuff. Um, also, if you're a GH5 owner, don't forget about the GH5 training that I've got. It's at gh5training.com. This is a $100, uh, five and a half hour long in-depth training course on the GH5. And I like to remind people that the cost of that training is 5% of the cost of the camera. So it's kind of worth it. Um, everybody who's bought it 
has rave reviews. I've gotten rave reviews. People love it. I have yet to have a single complaint about it, which I think is pretty awesome. I've had people tell me it's the best training out there. They've bought several of them. So, you know, I'm getting some nice kudos on that. Super appreciative to everybody who's bought it. If you don't have it yet, but you do have a GH5 or you're using one, please consider getting it. It is a worthy, worthy investment. Um, and if you're on lynda.com, that course is actually on Lynda as well. So you can watch it there. You don't have to buy it separately. So cool. All right, let's move on. The next one on here is setup. So we're on site. It's time to go. We're going to set up the cameras. What are we doing? Number one, try to position the cameras where people won't walk in front of them. <laughs> you know, you, you think, all right, people are going to sit down. I can put a camera. People always get up and leave. People come in late. So um, one of my cameras, I had people walking in front of. It was kind of annoying. It wasn't critical. It wasn't a lot, but it was one of those. I'm watching and going, really? Really? People? Seriously? So just keep that in mind. If you can position the cameras where you don't have to worry about people walking in front of them, do it. If there's enough space where, let's say it's a tiered seating, you know, a theater seating, and you got a camera here and this row, if someone's in that row, it's gonna, they're gonna get in the way, but the next row is fine, tape it off. Just, if there's enough seating, just tape it off. Make sure that nobody's gonna get in there and get in your shot. So, one of those things to think about. Um, okay, camera settings. So, in video, we generally want to shoot at 180 degree shutter. All right, we talked about this before. We'll link to that up here. We did a big show on shutter speed versus shutter angle. Talked about why you shoot shutter angle, the advantages of 180 degree, yada, yada, yada. We did all that. That's where you want to start. But honestly, for something like this, you can totally get away from that. You can, you can go to a, a narrower, basically a longer or shorter shutter speed. There's not much movement as people on stage talking, um, unless you're shooting like acrobatics or something, then it's obviously that's different. But if you're shooting just a bunch of talking heads, you can adjust your shutter angle, it's fine. So, um, but start at 180 and adjust the shutter angle if needed so that you can get the exposure that you want. It'd be better to, I think, go for, uh, adjust your shutter angle, get a slower shutter speed, if you will, than it would be to crank the ISO if you are in a low light situation, which you're going to be in. You're going to be in a low light situation in an environment like this. So just something to keep in mind. Um, manual white balance. Don't leave your camera in auto white balance because especially if lights are changing, if uh, somebody's, if they're adjusting house lights, like in this situation, the lights would go off so they could play video and then come back on again. Uh, maybe you're in a situation where they're using colored spotlights or whatever. You don't want your camera adjusting the white balance because the environment's changing. So figure out what your white balance is, lock it in, and leave it there. Um, if, on that same note, if possible, get an exposure and white balance reading using a gray card off of the most important subject, in this case, your audience on stage under their house lighting. I had a real challenge with this in that they, the setup time wasn't great. I would have, it would have been great to have a little bit more setup time. There were some other things that I was involved with as well during the setup that kept me from focusing entirely on the cameras. But the biggest problem that I had was that they never, the audience, um, uh, the guests never stood on stage with the house lights on, with the, I should say the house lights, with the stage lights on before the show actually started. Right. And I, I kept, I, you know, we'd get house lights on, we'd get the lights on for like a minute, and then somebody turned them off because they needed it for something else. And I was never able to get a true proper exposure set before the show actually started. So, you know, we got the full house lights on, no stage lights on. Stage lights would come on for maybe half a minute or so, and then they'd go off again, never with people actually sitting up there. Finally, the guests go up there and they sit down essentially in the dark, and the spotlights come on, the show starts, and I'm going, crap, record. And now I've got to make adjustments while I'm recording. So the first, say, half minute of recording, I'm messing with exposure trying to get the right balance. So do everything you can to get that set ahead of time. I didn't have that luxury, and it turned out to be a, a pain in the butt. And it turned out to, um, it made me realize a couple other important things that I'm about to get to. Um, first one being, if you're using a waveform monitor, which I use waveform monitors all the time on the camera, if you're using that on the Lumix cameras, make sure that the waveform monitor is on before you hit record. Once you're recording, you can't enable it. I don't know why. I don't know if that's, there's gotta be a good reason for it. But once you're recording, you can't turn that on or off. So on one of my cameras, I didn't have it on before and I hit record because I went, ah, oh, crap, it's starting and hit record. And, um, and ended up not having that waveform to be able to super count, super adjust my exposure, really make sure it was critical. My exposures were fine all the way across, but it was one of those like, eh, I don't have my waveforms, this is not cool. So make sure your waveforms, if you use them, are turned on. The um, levels you can toggle on and off while recording, so that's what I ended up relying on, but I like the waveforms and I didn't have them for one of my cameras. Not good. If you're using zebras, make sure your zebras are set the way you want them. You can set your zebras to be calibrated for skin tone. You can set your zebras to be calibrated for pure white or just under white, 95%. Whatever it is you like, you know, you have your way of working. That's great. Just make sure they're set the way you want before you start recording because, once again, 
Um, just like the waveforms, you can't change those while it's recording. You can't get into the menu system while it's recording. So you'd have to stop recording to make that change. And ideally here, when you start recording, you're not going to stop. So you don't want to have to stop recording, make changes, and start recording. And you want to have a consistent recording all the way through. Uh, next on the setup list, we talked about microphones again. Make sure your microphones are on all cameras, but also check all your levels. Right? Use those headphones we talked about, plug them in, look at the meters. You want to look at those audio level meters, don't just rely on the headphones, and make sure that your audio levels are good. And keeping in mind that every camera is going to have different settings. You're going to have one that's got your XLR input, hopefully, so you got to make sure your levels are good there. And that was one that I was able to set up in advance. So I got the XLR cable off of the soundboard into the XLR one. I'm looking at the meters on the camera. I'm sitting right next to the sound guy. Um, he's on a microphone talking to do some tests, and he's adjusting my output. And I'm going, oh, no, I need more, I need more, I need more. And he gave me more power until I got enough so that I was getting to the right levels that I wanted to on camera. Thank goodness I was able to do that in advance. Um, but even there, I did not get to hear the presenters talking on microphone until the show actually started. So even there, the sound guy, he and who's in the same position, same boat, he's going, oh, I'm trying to make adjustments to everybody during the first few minutes of the live show. So. Um, you know, you can do what you can, but make sure that all your audio levels are good across all of your cameras before you start. And again, you may have to make adjustments um, while you're going. Um, make sure the volume is up on the camera output so you can monitor. And here's here's what this means. So if you're if you plug your headphones into the GH5 or GH5S, and you can hear whatever the microphone's hearing, right? Great. And this is you know, for monitoring. By default, these cameras have um, the command dial on the back by default, will adjust your volume, right? So I'm listening to the headphones, this will adjust the volume while I'm recording video. However, in the, which update was it? The one point, no, the two, I think the 2.0 update, well, anyway, one of the firmware updates for these cameras allowed you to map ISO adjustment to this command dial, which I think is one of the greatest features in the world. So I have ISO on here, but that means that I no longer have a physical dial to adjust volume. The only way to adjust volume is to go into the menus. That's fine because I almost never use it, but one of my cameras, I had the volume turned down, didn't realize it, so when I plugged in the headphones once the show started and I started recording, I couldn't actually monitor the audio. Fortunately, I could see the audio, the audio meters bouncing on here, so I was able to know, you know, it looks fine, but you know, you still want to hear it. You want to just know. So one of my cameras, I couldn't know, and that was a little unnerving, um, but it was okay. Again, because I had the visual representation at least. But point is, Especially if you don't have physical control of the volume, make sure the volume is turned up high enough before you start recording, because once you hit record, you will no longer be able to adjust it. Uh, have extra memory cards ready. If you are going to do a longer recording than whatever your card has, let's so say you can get 32 minutes of recording off your card, uh, make sure your cards are ready to go. And by ready, what I would recommend, and I realize this may not be possible always, but I would recommend not having them in your pocket or in a memory card thing in your pocket, because that could get left somewhere else. Right? You go, oh, it's time to go swap out the, the, um, the card in this camera on camera one, and you go up to that camera and you realize, oh crap, I left the cards down at camera two, which is on the other side of the building. Don't do that. Leave the cards, your new cards, with the camera. So you walk up and you go, like, pop one out, pop it back in, it's all there and ready to go, and you know. So if you're going to have to swap out cards mid-shoot, leave the cards there. Uh, again, it may not always be possible. It may not be a safe environment. I don't know. You just may not be able to, but if you can, I would highly recommend doing that. Um, start recording your cameras, each camera several minutes apart, so there's time to swap out cards or batteries or whatever you might need to, and they don't all run out at once. And, and here's what I mean by this. If, because the, the starting was kind of a surprise, because things were just kind of going a little bit crazy, it was like, oh crap, they're starting, I had to run around and start all three cameras at the same time, or, you know, within, let's say within 30 to 45 seconds of each other. If you know that you are going to have to swap out your memory cards because your show is, let's say it's an hour long show, you got 30 minutes per card. You know you're gonna have to swap it out. Don't start them all at the same time because they're all gonna run out at the same time. So start them several minutes apart, right? You start one and then you do this ideally before the show starts. You start one and then how much time do you need? Two minutes, five minutes, what do you need? Give yourself enough time to comfortably swap out the card. And when if you're going to have to swap out the card mid-shoot, you really don't want to, uh, you don't want to just yank the card in the middle of, uh, you know, some important story. Ideally, you can wait until there's some critical part is finished being talked about, so you have all your cameras rolling for that, and then maybe when the moderator is talking, because they are arguably the least important person on stage, 
Sorry, buddy. Um, the least important person on stage, maybe while they're talking, that's the time to stop recording, pull out the card, pop in a new one. It's going to take you, what are you going to lose? 10 seconds or so of recording time. Um, but you can do that during the question might be an ideal time to, to do that. Or if you are, let's say it's the wide shot, maybe the wide shot isn't really the one that you want when the moderator's talking. You know, you want those close-ups um, you want the close-ups when the guests are talking, so you can swap out the wide when the guest is talking because you don't need them. Does that make sense? You just think about the camera. Do I need this camera angle right now? When's a good time to swap this out and do it then? And give yourself time to do it. Um, yeah, so start recording several minutes apart so there's time to swap out the cards and all cameras don't stop at the same time. Use Relay Record, not Backup, and this is specific to the GH series cameras, um, if there's any possibility of going over the max record duration. Okay, now we get to the part where I, where I have to admit the major mistake that I made. So I, I tested all, I tested the camera before him, um, tested duration, recording duration, want to make sure the battery would last, no problem. You know, put in your cards, record for a full 45 minutes, battery's down to like, you know, 75%. Perfect, great. Um, however, when I did that, I must have been using my 64 gig cards because when I went on set, I put in my 32s and did not realize, because I was running around like an idiot, that uh, I was only getting 32 minutes recording time. It's 32, 32, 33 minutes recording time off of a 32 gig card, and uh, the show is 45 minutes long. <laughs> so what I was doing was I was recording relay record, where they were both recording at the same time because I wanted that backup. It's a once, you know, one-time event. I want to make sure we've got critical. You know, it's, it's important. I want to make sure that everything's recorded, backed up, and so on. Um, and that's not relay. That's um, that's backup recording. What I should have been doing is relay recording so one filled and it went over to the other one automatically. I didn't do that on purpose because I thought I had enough time because in my tests I did have enough time, but again, my tested with different cards because I'm an idiot. So major, major mistake. So what this meant, what actually happened to me, and this is super embarrassing to admit, but I'm telling you this so that you can learn from my idiotic mistakes. I'm recording on my, my main camera, right? And I suddenly realize it's no longer recording. And I go, did hit record again. Did I hit stop somehow? Hit record again, and it goes like two seconds recording one stop, and it says card full. I go, oh crap. And then I realize, oh crap, my other two cameras just ran out as well. Should run up to them, sure enough, they have. So pop out the cards, swap out the cards in there, but I ended up with um, th three and a half, I think, minutes of no video. So what I ended up doing was the they had title cards, slide, you know, title slides that they used, um, like an announcement slide with the name of the thing and everybody's name on there. I ended up putting that up over the blank video because I had, thank God, audio on this. So I, when my bacon was saved by this guy, but that was a really amateur, stupid mistake to make. Um, don't make that mistake. Learn from me. Don't be like me. <sighs> now that we're past that embarrassment, let's move on. Okay, while rolling. Uh, some good stuff coming up here in the in the comments. If you have any questions, get them into the chit chat, get them into the comment room here. We will come back for Q&A after all of this. Um, and if you're watching this not live, the Q&A is hopefully going to be very interesting for this. Okay, while rolling, we're almost done here. Um, know when your cards will fill <laughs> or your batteries will die if that's if you're doing something really long. Um, and so you can be there ready and try to make the swap times at not critical moments. We already talked about that, but, where's my phone? Um, use timers. So I have an app on here show you. Get this back up. I have an app on my phone, and I don't know if this is available on Android or not. Um, do not know. Sorry. This is an iOS app that uh, that has multiple timers in it. Super cool. Super cool app. So if it ever... There it goes. Uh, let's see here. Ooh, here we go. There's the one. So this app is simply called Timer. You can see in the top right there, the gray one is called Timer. Very helpful generic name. Um, in fact, let me go into the settings here and see. It's very old looking, but um, there's like no name of the company here. If I hit share this app, maybe it'll show something useful. Um, geez, nope. Okay, add to notes. Let's see, I'm trying to get the name, like the name of the company of the app. That's what I'm trying to do here. Timer by contrast. There we go. So search for timer by contrast. And here's what you get. See, there's all these different times. These are all presets. And you can see the things I use them for. My washer and dryer. Um, if I'm cooking, like, bread, rising times, all that kind of stuff. But look at the bottom ones. Camera one, camera two, camera three. So you can set this. If I tap and hold on that, it comes up, and I can say time, and I can set the time to whatever I want. Um, so I set a default of 28 minutes for these. And you can name it whatever you want, change the color. And then you start each one, and now I've got a countdown for each camera. 
right? So that you know, a few minutes go by and I start camera two, and a few minutes go by and I start camera three. Now each camera has a separate timer running, so at any time I can look and see how much time I've got left on each camera. Highly, highly recommend doing something like that because that, my friends, is super, super handy. So grab that app. It's not a free app, but you know, like any other app, it's a buck or two at the most. So grab that guy. Okay. Uh, that was roll rolling. Next one on here is uh, check your cameras regularly. Even though everything's set up, you know it's all good, just, just check them. Just every 10, 15 minutes or so, just go check them because you never know. You just never know. Don't get confident that, oh, it's all fine. So just check them out. If manually operating a close-up camera, don't stop rolling. Um, you would, might be tempted to, on the camera that you're manually operating, controlling to like you would be shooting normally, start and stop recording whenever you get a shot. So you frame up a shot, start rolling. Okay, stop rolling, reframe the shot, start rolling it. Don't do that. Just hit record and let it go the entire time. It'll make the multicam edit a lot easier for one, but two, it'll also give you the possibility of capturing something you might not have because you're busy moving the camera around. Right? You might be, let's just say that you're stopping and then moving the camera. So you set up a shot, you get it, you roll. Now I stop recording, now I'm gonna reframe. And you start to move over, but uh, I don't know, while reframing this shot, something really great happens. And that would have been a great close up, but you weren't rolling. Maybe the framing one isn't perfect, but you would have at least had it. So just keep that, just, just let it roll. Don't stop it, it'll make the syncing easier later. Um, just let it roll the whole time. So that's, that's it, just simple little thing, just let it roll. Oh, that's it, okay. So that's everything on there. Um, now let's take a look at the edit. You guys want to see the edit and final cut? I'm not going to go like really deep into it, but I'm going to show you the edit and final cut very briefly, just so you can kind of see how it went together. Multicam editing in Final Cut Pro is awesome. It is very easy to synchronize everything. You basically just select and you hit sync, and it works because Final Cut's awesome. And then you have a multicam edit that while you're shooting, uh, while you're editing, you can use keyboard shortcuts to just cut between camera angles. It's pretty awesome, right? So let's uh, let me go full screen on this. And let's uh, see what I have audio in here. I do have audio. Um, Ryan, make sure that the audio from the Mac is enabled. And let's take a look at it. OK, so uh, let's see here. Where's my file? So here, let's take a look at the files to start. There's, um, I, I brought everything. Oh, by the way, I brought everything in, copied all the files over into separate folders, labeled them, named them, so that, um, Ryan, you're on the air. You're on me. Um, so that, uh, <laughs> he's coughing in my ear there, so that uh, you know what they are by name without having to rely on uh, looking at them to see what they are. So let me actually see if those files are still set up in the finder here, and then you can see exactly what they are. Uh, yeah, here we go. So this is the audio, the, the video files. So there's camera one, the wide shot, and each one of those shots, right? The camera automatically breaks up the files into smaller pieces. So there's camera one, camera two, camera three, um, I had the panelists talked about movies, so I have those movies that I included in the video, or included pieces of them. I exported the slides out of Keynote, so here's the slide so that I could bring those in. So here's the, uh, the folks who were up on stage, Jacob Schwartz and uh, Samuel Bildo from Mystery Box and Sam KJ and his DP, Nick Musco. Um, so those slides I had ready to bring in as well, and then there is the dedicated audio file. You'll notice I named them. You know, Panasonic Cinegear 2018 Camera 1, Camera 2, if I'm zooming in a little bit, Camera 2, Camera 3, so that's all there. Um, just so that they're named that way so that I know exactly what I'm bringing in. And then I went into Final Cut, imported all these, and let's open up the inspector here. I went into each one of these, and I put a camera angle on there. So you see you've got this option in Final Cut, camera angle. So I assigned Camera 1, Camera 2, Camera 3 to all of those. And then all you got to do is select everything. So it's like, you know, select all your audio, all your video. This isn't all of it, but you select all of it once, right click on it and say new multicam clip. And that is all you have to do. It's remarkable how accurately it pulls everything together. Now I said that it did have troubles with one, the one camera where I didn't have a microphone on it. I realized the audio was almost non-existent on there. So it didn't quite get that one right. It was, it got some of the clips right, but there were a couple of them that weren't right. So I had to go in there and find it. I'm listening like crazy, listening, I'm listening for some sound to line it up to, looking at the video, trying to line it up. So um, definitely have a mic on each camera. That's, a, that's a, an important part to help you with your uh, multicam syncing. And then once you've got your multicam clip, let's see here, there's the multicam clip. We open that up. This is what you get inside of Final Cut. So there's the gap. Um, and uh, and then there's the dedicated audio file. And then when you're, wait, so there's my three camera angles, so you can see those. And then when you're editing it, you just drop that multicam clip onto your timeline. And let's see here, let me open this up. Um, I've actually done some other, oops, too far. 
done some additional changes to this. But here we go. So here is the multicam clip. And so here you can see as I just kind of scrub through it, how it's jumping between the two different camera angles in there. So if I, let me close this out, make this a little bit bigger on here. Um, let me actually, before I do that, let me just, that's okay, we'll change it. It doesn't really matter. I'll just hit undo. Um, this camera angle right there, that is currently set to camera three. You can see that here is camera three. If I hold down the option key and I hit camera two, it swaps that entire shot to camera two, right? I'm holding that option, I hit camera three, it goes back to camera three. But if I just hit two or three, so right now it's on three, I'm going to hit two. Notice here it made a cut and it switched it. So the idea here is that you're playing it. You literally can be watching this and, I don't know, are you guys hearing this? I don't think you are. I don't think the audio is right or right. That's okay. So, so we're doing that. And then I would just say, um, right, let's go to camera one. So I hit camera one and it switches and you see it actually cut it on the timeline. Now I'll switch it to camera two. Uh, now I'll switch back to camera one and so on. And so it actually makes the cuts on the timeline and makes the camera angle changes. And then you can change that if you need to. So I'm going to undo all that because I actually liked what I had in there. Uh, and that's pretty much it. And then there's, you know, you can go in and, and do audio enhancements. So here's one of the things I did with audio that was kind of fun. Um, let's see here. Where is it? I've done some other, I'm not going to get into like super nitty gritty on this edit, but um, right here is audience applause. And even with the sound that I had from the external mic, it really wasn't quite enough. So I ended up duplicating that and shifting it a little bit just to build up the applause a little bit because it just wasn't quite heavy enough um, because of the, the one camera that had the mic was way in the back. It just wasn't. So I just duplicated that, shifted a little bit, just add a little extra heavier applause layer in there just so it sounded a little more like it actually sounded Little things like that, but that's it. That's all I was going to show you. There, I really want like a massive how to multicam. If you guys really want like a full on in depth multicam editing thing in Final Cut, we can do that at some point. But uh, but the tools are there. It's super easy to use, and it's uh, it's pretty straightforward and pretty awesome. So that I think is everything I want to show you. That checklist that was the big thing. I wanted to go through all that, how to get ready for it. I just wanted to talk briefly about the post processing part of it. So I hope. That was interesting and useful to you guys. It's been a long show. Um, if you're still here, thanks a bunch. And if you are uh, interested in the Q&A, that is going to start up in just a moment here. So we'll see you back in just a second.